There's no tale that's ever been told that men would rather find out what's true than the gospel. Why? Because every desire of our heart is satisfied in it, is fulfilled in it. It fulfills the deepest desires of our heart. In the gospel, death is defeated. The grave has been overcome. Past sins and guilt are removed and taken away. We're washed clean. God Himself speaks to us. He comes and dwells among us. We see His glory. He suffers with us and for us. God does. In this story, we are adopted into the best of all families, the family of God. We're made heirs of all things. Creation will be ours, and it will be renewed. In this gospel, we're given a kingdom and a society, a perfect society, that is yet to come, where relationships don't break down, where our relationship with our spouse is a million times better than it is here, where our relationship with others lasts and we enjoy it and there is all pleasure and no sin. In this gospel, God comes and sets His tabernacle among us. Behold, God will dwell among men and we will see His glory. In this gospel, we're given a king who is both gentle and just. He's the king our heart has longed for and desired. In this gospel, we're reunited with loved ones that we've lost who are believing in Christ. We will be together forever. In this gospel, every evil is eternally dealt with. All of life is now made meaningful. Whether you eat or you drink, do it all to the glory of God. Every small action, changing a diaper, is made meaningful because God can be glorified through your heart's response, through your, through your believing. All of life now has meaning. This is the best story ever told because it makes sense of our story. It changes our story. Our lives are changed because of this gospel story. So now I want to ask the question, what does the gospel make us? What does the gospel make us? And by us, I mean those who believe the gospel. What does the gospel make us? I asked myself this question this week, and in the course of about an hour, I had 62 answers. What does the Bible say that the gospel makes us? And I'm just going to share with you this morning a tithe of those answers, six what does the gospel make us? And as you hear these things, ask your heart, do I believe this? Am I living like this is true? Am I living believing this? First, the gospel makes us adopted children of God. Adopted children of God. Ephesians 1 verse 5 says that we were predestined to the adoption as sons. We were predestined to be adopted into God's family as sons. Christians in this life should have the biggest heart in the world for adoption because it fits our story. It's what has happened to us. It's what God has done for us. We were without home and without compassion, without family, and God brought us in. We were by the side of the road, abandoned, struggling in our blood. And God came along and had compassion on us and said, live to us and brought us into the family, put the ring on our finger and a robe on us and adopted us to be His sons. We should have such a heart for adoption because that has been done to us. We've been adopted. Adoption is the narrative of our life. It's the narrative of our life. And so we are for earthly adoption because we've been adopted on a cosmic level by God. This is why we have an adoption fund started here at Open Door. So families who feel this desire, this burden in their heart, God has adopted me, I want to adopt and bring others into my family because God has brought me into His family. 
we have that fun to enable our people to do that. Because you are children of God by adoption. You are children of God by adoption. Live like it. Live like children of God. Live like it. Let's believe the gospel that we are adopted and then let's go out and live like it. Secondly, what does the gospel make us? The gospel makes us the bride of the best bridegroom. But you didn't see that coming. The bride of the best bridegroom. Revelation 19, 7 says, Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made him herself ready. We are the bride of Christ. And this is amazing. This is amazing that God modeled this momentary marriage that bride and groom join in now in this life. He modeled it after the eternal marriage, the eternal marriage relationship that the Lamb will have with His people, not vice versa. Do you see that? God, in eternity past, having this gospel in mind, said, I want this relationship with my people, and then He creates from that a relationship in life to mirror it, husband and wife. This is amazing. And Paul tells us this in Ephesians 5. This is amazing. He commands husbands, love your wives, and loving them as an outworking of the gospel. Not just because you should. Don't love your wife because I've given you a rule to love your wife. Love your wife because Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. This is, this is your model this is the model you follow. Paul says, He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and, tre- and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Did you get that? Christ nourishes and cherishes the church as the bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom who loves nourishes, cherishes you. That's what the gospel has done. He's made you a cherished bride. You are loved. You are valued. You are cherished much more than the best bridegroom in the best romance novel or movie possibly could. You got that? Jesus is the substance. Everything else is the shadow. Ladies, Mr. Darcy is a shadow, but Jesus is the substance. He's the substance. He's the real bridegroom. Everything else is shadow. Do I really believe this? Ask your heart. Do I really believe this gospel reality? Because some of you here, young people, you may never marry. You may never know the shadow, but you already have the substance. You already have Christ. And so you're free. You're free to go to Africa and care for orphans and care for those with AIDS. There's, there's a lady, a young lady in her 20s, early 20s in Uganda right now, adopted more than a dozen little girls and cares for them. And she's free to without husband because she has a heavenly husband who is better than any on earth. Am I believing this, that I am the bride of Christ? Because believing this should lead to contentment. I should be content. Christ loves me. He cherishes me. He treasures me. I should be content. Ladies, your earthly husband may be a poor image bearer of this, but you have the substance. You have Christ. You have Christ as your heavenly husband. We all do in the body of Christ. He loves us. He cherishes us. We are the bride of the best bridegroom. Also, the gospel makes us brothers of the best elder brother. Brothers of the best elder brother. Romans 8, 29 says, God predestined us to become conformed to the image of his Son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. You get that? He's the firstborn. He is the elder brother. But I'm afraid many of us have earthly brothers who are more like the brothers in Jesus' parable. Remember, Jesus said, I'm going to tell you a story about two brothers. Two brothers. The younger was the prodigal. He pursued the path of self-discovery. I want my inheritance. I'm going to spin it the way I want to. The elder brother 
was like a Pharisee. He pursued the path of moral conformity. He tells his father, I have always obeyed you. I'm not going into that feast. I have always obeyed you. I've always kept the rules and done everything. Too many of us have br brothers in this life who are like prodigals or like Pharisees. They're self-righteous. But Jesus is the best elder brother. What should the elder brother have done in the parable? It would have been his responsibility to go out and pursue the lost son, to pursue the younger brother, and say to the father, whatever the cost, whatever the pain, whatever the expense I must bear, I will bring my brother back home. I will bring him back into the family. And that's what Christ does. Christ pursues us when we were lost. We were the lost sons, and he came after us. He brings us back home. He brings us home and rejoices to share his inheritance with us. The older brother in the parable, he's stingy. You know, the fatted calf was mine. It was my inheritance. But Christ is the best elder brother, and he gives all that he has to us. He says, whoever overcomes, you shall sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down on my father's throne. Jesus is the best elder brother. The gospel makes us a family without dividing walls. Point four. The, what does the gospel make us? It makes us a family without dividing walls. Ephesians 2, Paul says, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. The barrier that we naturally erect between ourselves, between races, between economic groups, between education levels, Christ breaks it down. He breaks down the hostility between races. He breaks down the hostility between classes because we are all one together in him. He brings us together in one body. He's broken down the dividing wall and made us all family. He declares to his disciples, you are all brothers. You are all brothers. You are a family. And your father and mother and wife and children may reject you in this life, but you will receive a hundred times over mothers and brothers and fathers and children because you will be received into a new family, the family of God, the church. And you will receive a hundredfold in this life and in the life to come, eternal life. We are part of the best family.